Okay, so we'll start. I did do uh, uh, length squared sampling. That is already done. So that's the matrix multiplication theorem. I'll put this up and then we'll use it for the compressed representation of a matrix, which we went through fast. We'll go through this carefully. So I take AB. I want to find this product. This is the estimate, the spectral norm. <coughs> I'm sorry, the Frobenius norm. So for the multiplication is less than or equal to A D over square root of S. Okay, because I took the square root. Of course, uh, this is a random variable. It's an expectation. But just remember, if I pick S samples to multiply, I, the error goes down as root S, 1 over root S. Okay, that we will use uh, when we do the compressed sensing. So compress, not, a, not compressed sensing, sorry, compression, compressed representation. Uh, so this was just recap. This is what we are doing now. Is an M by N matrix, big, uh, potentially big in both dimensions, M and N. Okay. Uh, we'll show, without assumptions on A, we'll show that A can be approximated provided you give me just a sample of rows of A and a sample of columns of A. Okay. But the sampling has to be length squared to get reasonable error bounds. Right? If the sampling is done with arbitrary probabilities, then we don't know good error bounds. Okay. Uh, you can always get a bound on the variance, but it won't be so good, that's all. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Then we went through the intuition. Let me go through the intuition fast, and then we'll get to the Formal proof we didn't do, so I'll do that now. So first, can we just pick a sample of rows? We said no, because the rows don't tell us anything about unsampled rows. Uh, but if the rank is kh is very small, and if rows are in general position, if I pick a large multiple of k, I should pin down the row space. Basically, I should get everybody in the row space right by that point. Uh, but we still don't know for unsampled row what linear combination of the sampled rows it is. And here was a picture, right? So I sampled these rows. And here is another row, unsampled. I know nothing about this from the information I have on those. However, we said intuitively this. If I picked a sample of 100k columns as well, that should be sufficient. So I pick a lot of columns. Then I know all these entries. And I want these entries. If things are in general position now, these entries, uh, I want these. These are so many equations. Uh, but there are enough unknowns that that's easy to solve, pin down, right? Sorry. There are more equations than unknowns. So because this is 100k, okay, and the rank is only k. So there are k unknowns, 100k equations. They are in general position. You should be able to pin it down. So that was the idea. And we want to rigorously prove it. So here's a picture, big A, sample of columns, sample of rows. And the assertion is, from the sample rows and columns, I can find a matrix U to put in here, right? So that the product is approximately right. And uh, you know, if there are S columns and S rows, it's S by S, this thing. This won't be diagonal. If I did SVD, we'll see later, or spectral decomposition, this would be diagonal, right? Spectral decomposition, you're all familiar with diagonal entries will be eigenvalues. In singular value decomposition, which we'll see, the diagonal entries will be singular values. And it'll be zero off diagonal. But this will not be zero off diagonal, necessarily. OK, so we gave this example. I won't run through the example again. Uh, but the example was to illustrate that the norm we want to bound is a spectral norm. So we want this approximation to have the property that the spectral norm is bounded. That's the correct norm. Uh, just based on this motivation. And we'll see a bound that goes down as s to the one third in the square. So if I take square root, it's s to the one sixth as opposed to root s. It's a worse convergence, but we are doing more because we are compress we are approximating any matrix. So okay. Uh, okay, so now the idea. This we went through again, but I'll recap and then we'll prove things today. The idea is this. I'm going to do a funny thing. Uh, I'm going to pretend I'm multiplying A with the identity matrix, right? Which, uh, of course, I won't do. But I let's pretend that. And I'm going to apply this result 
matrix multiplication result to that pretend multiplication. That's what we're going to do, right? So we are multiplying A with I sampling by sampling S columns of A, okay? Then the error from here is the Frobenius norm of A times Frobenius norm of I divided by root S, right? That's this one. But the Frobenius norm of I is root N. Frobenius norm squared is N, right? It's the sum of squares of all the entries, root N. So this doesn't do much good because I need S to be at least N to get any sensible result, right? Getting an error of AF is not sensible. I could have just output zero, right, for A and got an error of at most this much. So that's not interesting. So to get anything interesting, I have to see, I seem to have to make S N or greater. So that's no good. Uh, now, uh, we picked, remember R was a set of rows. We picked a bunch of rows. Uh, R, R transpose is a small matrix. We picked R rows, so it's an R by R matrix. We assume it's invertible. Uh, now, that's again intuitively true. So R has, I mean, only R rows, right? If A has high enough rank, okay, now forget the rank K, I'm going to do it in general now. If A has high enough rank, B should be independent if in general position, right? And then RR transpose will be invertible as long as the rows are independent. Right? So we assume that. If it's not, just as an aside, the full proof does not assume it, but we'll only do the proof when this is assumed. If you don't assume it, you have to do something called the pseudo inverse. Uh, and I won't do that. I'll assume it's invertible. Okay. Uh, then uh, look at this matrix P. Uh, this is just a projection matrix. So it's R transpose R, R transpose inverse R. This acts as the identity on the row space of R. So what I'm going to do is replace the I, which is bad, with the P. And P is an identity lookalike, right? So because it is the identity on a, on a subspace. So why is that? So that's a proof here. So suppose V is a subspace spanned by the rows of R. Then I want to prove that P acts as identity and the proof is simple. So since X is in the row space of R, it can be written like that. X transpose can be written as a combination of uh, rows of R. So PX, you just write it down, you get that. Right? And then R R transpose inverse and R R transpose cancel out, and you get R transpose Y, which is just X itself. So it, it, act, it does act as the identity, as claimed. And for vectors in the orthogonal complement, that, that is entirely the null space of P. So PX is zero because um, RX is zero, right? So X is orthogonal to the row space of R, so RX is zero, so it's a zero. Right? That's, that's all I'm saying. So instead of pretend AI, do pretend AP. We'll prove two things which together imply, we want to prove that A minus CUR is small. We'll prove two steps. First, A minus AP is small. So this is going to come from this theorem, right? So I'm, I'm pretend multiplying A times P to get an approximation to A itself, because P is like the identity. So this theorem will tell us it's small. Okay, that's step one. And the second step is, is going to prove that AP minus CUR is small. So if you add these together, by triangle inequality, you bound A minus CUR, which is what we want to do. So why is this? So this is another application of this theorem. So uh, suppose C is a length squared sample of columns of A. That's what we started with. Okay, then we'll see that the corresponding rows of A, rows of P, excuse me, can be written as u times r. And the hint for this is p ends in r. So p is actually something times r. So if I pick some rows of p, that's like some u times r. r is there for us at the end, right? So, okay. so uh, this is small because I'm multiplying a and b by a, a times p by sampling. That's I'm sampling a columns of a, that's c. I'm sampling corresponding rows of P, that's U times R. Okay. So there'll be a second application of this, right? So together it'll give us a result. So this hastily, I, I, I told you this last time, but now I'm going to go over the proof of this. Okay. So again, the proofs are simple, but uh, once you have this, so I'm gonna go over that. Okay, so proposition first, 
P acts like the identity, but only in a small subspace. So, but we'll still claim that A and AP are roughly equal. If it's completely the identity, it would have been exactly equal, but that's not true. So, in other words, I want to assert P is a random variable, so I'm going to assert that the expected operator spectral norm is small, one over root r times that. And why is that? Um, a minus AP squared is the, uh, is, uh, this is just a definition of the spectral norm, max over all unit length vectors of A minus AP x squared. Okay. Now, two cases, x could be in the row space of R, then we saw that Px is the, P is identity, so Px is x, so Apx is just Ax, and so it's zero. That's no problem. I'm trying to prove the norm is small. It's zero is very good. Okay, it's a zero vector, so the norm is zero. So, uh, so we need to consider only vectors in the orthogonal complement space, because uh, every vector is a sum of uh, something in V and V perp. So the max is attained by somebody in V perp, right? Orthogonal complement of V. And in that space, Px is zero. We saw that. That's all the null space of P. So A minus APX is just AX, right? PX becomes zero. So now I have to bound AX, okay, for a subspace orthogonal to R. Okay. So X is orthogonal to R. The rough idea, what is this saying? The rough idea, um, what, is, what am I going to say? I'm going to say AX is small. I picked a sample of rows of A, and I'm saying everybody orthogonal to just a sample actually is fairly orthogonal to A itself. That's what this is saying, right? If X was fairly orthogonal to A, it would be zero of this. So it's saying if it's orthogonal to a sample, it's actually orthogonal nearly to A itself. Makes sense, sense but it's going to be important it's length squared, otherwise it's not going to be true, right? Uh, it's not true if you pick a random sample, the variance is high, right? So if you had some rows that are very heavy and other rows are all zero, the sample doesn't tell you much but length squared is enough to prove this. Okay. So here is a proof of that. So I'm going to write AX squared as X transpose A transpose AX, right? And I'm going to rewrite that as X transpose A transpose A minus R transpose RX. So why is this true? Anybody want to take a guess off? Yeah, Rx is zero, so I only added zero, so I subtracted zero, that's fine, okay? So that, by definition, is at most the spectral norm of A, uh, sorry, spectral norm of A transpose A minus R transpose R, okay? And I want to say this is small, okay? I want to say A transpose A minus R transpose R is small. R is just a bunch of rows of A, I picked at random, any idea what might make this small? Pro how would I prove that? So why is it that if I pick a bunch of rows at random but length squared, this, then this is a good approximation to this in spectral norm, let's say. Yeah, anything? So it's this one, right? I am multiplying A transpose by A by sampling some columns of A transpose, which are just rows of A. That's my R transpose, right? I'm taking the corresponding rows of A, which is R. Okay. So this, this is small because of the matrix multiplication theorem, because of this. I'm not actually doing it, right? This is only for the proof. I'm not actually multiplying A transpose by A algorithmically, right? So suffice us to prove that this is small matrix multiplication theorem. Why? Again, I didn't write down all of the why, but I am again, uh, so to do multiplication of A transpose times A, I have to pick random columns of A transpose, which are rows of A, length squared rows of A, and that's R. And I must take this corresponding rows of A, this A, and that's R again. And uh, so, okay, sorry, I, I, we should. So I'm multiplying A transpose by A. So this Frobenius norm of A squared, but in the square it's fourth power. It would have been divided by root R, but in the square it's divided by R, right? That's all I'm saying. 
So this is an expectation. I, I, I was sloppy here. This is expectation, right? These are random variables. So the three clearest, this is not true at all. That's what you have. This, yeah, okay, sorry, good point. Uh, so in fact, I am asserting, I, I'm, this is even, this is a bit weaker. This is even Frobenius norm, right? It turns out, okay, I'm not able to use the Frobenius norm because all I have here is two norm. I cannot, for this part, I cannot assert Frobenius norm, okay, because of this. See, this way of doing x in this space or that, I'm only proving for a single x, so I'm not proving for Frobenius norm. So, excuse me, I should have said that, but two norm is always smaller than Frobenius norm. I mean, maybe I should write down a little proof. So, two norm is uh, x max x transpose ax. Well, not, okay. ax squared, right, is equal to x transpose a transpose ax. And then uh, one thing you can do is apply um, cauchy schwarz and you get that, okay. So, I, maybe I won't write down the proof. Please go home and do prove this that the spectral norm is at most a Frobenius norm. Okay. So uh, I get that and then, so that's just what I said already and it's written down there more carefully. So okay, so excuse me, let's go back one minute. So I have proved here so far, only this, right? I only proved this. I have to prove the other part of the uh, bargain. There were two inequalities to prove. A, P, and C are roughly equal. Now, this is proved, again, by applying this. So, C is a length squared sample of columns of A. Want to pick corresponding rows of P. See, I'm multiplying A and P. I pick columns of A, which form C. I must pick the corresponding rows of P. But P is of this form. So if I pick some rows of P, I can always write that as U times R, right? I leave the R alone and I pick some rows of all of this and that's my U. Okay. All I have to notice is that there's an R at the end, which I have. Okay. So that tells you how to find U as well. So you, you find U by taking the rows of this quantity. And the error is uh, now, now in Frobenius norm, because uh, multiplying matrices A and P, I get that, okay? Uh, and I have to divide by S, because uh, I picked S sample. I'm still to bound this quantity, Frobenius norm of P, I don't know what it is, right? I have to get rid of that. So, bounding this, P has rank R, P is, P is there. So we assumed R is full rank. That's why I could write the inverse. And R has R rows, so the rank of P is also R, small r, right? And we saw it acts as the identity on an R-dimensional subspace, and the rest is null space. Any such matrix has Frobenius norm R. Again, you, you should prove that uh, at home, but it's very simple, right? It's basically just the identity, R-dimensional identity right, because zero outside of that. So it's an R-dimensional identity matrix, so it has Frobenius norm squared R, sorry, Frobenius norm squared R, just R once on the diagonal in the correct basis, if you write it in the right basis, right? Putting this together, you get, okay, so this error is R by S, that R by S, because the top you get an R there, this goes R, R by S. The other error is one over root R, so the optimal choice of R is S to the two-thirds, right? The optimal choice of R is S to the two-thirds. That's just a little calculus. Uh, you, basically, if you have two terms like that, you make them equal, right? That's the best choice. I mean, you can do a differentiation and make sure. Differentiate with respect to R, keeping S fixed, and you see that R is S to the two-thirds is the best choice. Um, and so then we get the theorem. Uh, I'm going to just list, uh, yeah, there was a question? No. So uh, A is an M by N matrix, R and S are positive integers. C is an M by S matrix of columns. 
length squared sampling, R is length squared sampling of rows. R and S are not necessarily equal. And the conclusion is we can find from C and R an S by R, S by R matrix U so that this is valid. This is true for any R and S, right? So, of course, it makes no sense if R is greater than S. You get a huge error. You can make it greater than S. It is still true, the theorem, but it doesn't tell you much. But the best choice of R is S to the two thirds. Okay. So that's only the spectral norm. There is also a bound on the Frobenius norm, uh, which I didn't write down. If there's time later, I can, I'll, I'll go over that. Uh, but maybe that's all uh, I want to say for now. Uh, before I, I'm going on to the next lecture, I mean, next topic, which is SVD. Okay. So this is not the best you can do now. I believe there are better results. I can give you references for, uh, for this, right? So there are better things than this to be said. Yeah. Is this the best way? It's some, right? You prove that the choice of distributions are sometimes optimal, right? You must improve upon those. Right. Is there an improvement with respect to that? So, uh, good point. So, the if I wanted to do one multiplication of A and A transpose, right. then it's true that length squared was optimal. Right. Okay. So, this length squared will still do length squared. So, length squared is optimal once you fix the number of samples you take. That's still going to be the case, except you'll fix the number of samples slightly differently and the argument changes. But I don't remember actually all the changes. Part of the answer, part of, I mean, I don't know the precise answer actually. I should look up the paper. But. Is it immediately like adaptive sampling is the way to go instead of head samples? Yeah. That's what has to be improved. So, okay. So that's, a go that's right. So there's all new uh, subject in some sense. Uh, Length squared is not the only thing you can do. Uh, it turns out there's, uh, I mean, later methods now do adaptive sampling. Uh, roughly adaptive sampling you can think of. So length squared picked one vector with probability proportional to length squared. Uh, I don't know whether I showed this to you, but you can instead pick pairs of vectors with probability proportional to the area of the triangle that you, uh, that you spend. So length squared is a one dimensional measure, right? Instead, I could look at all the pairs of rows and pick that, pick pairs with probability proportional to the area squared. Or more, you can pick three tuples of rows with probability proportional to the square of the volume of the simplex they enclose, and so on. So this, vol this is called determinantal process volume sampling that turns out to give much better results. It takes a long time, and also the proofs are harder. I won't do this in this course, but I mean, uh, I can give a reference. How do, how do we construct U? So going back to the slide. Uh, here. So uh, I, I picked, okay, I picked some columns of A to make my C up. I want to pick the same rows of P, which is the same as picking exactly those rows of R transpose. So R transpose is a long skinny matrix because R was flat. So I want to pick the rows of R transpose which correspond to the columns of C. So my U then is, I do that and then hit it with R R transpose inverse. Uh, to compute it, I have to find R R transpose inverse. Uh, one thing I should have said, I mean, maybe that's a good question to uh, answer, right? I should have said, right, the computational effort, so you got to sample and do all these things, but the computational effort is mainly finding the inverse of this matrix. But this is a small matrix. This is R by R. So I do have to compute the inverse of that. Okay. The rest of the time I'm only doing samples and taking the samples and putting them together and so on. But this one computation I have to do. The optimal choice of R may not be this, yes. It's also possible. I didn't prove that it's R. Oh, 
what do we do if A is low rank? Uh, no, no I, two things I don't know, uh, meaning, so if k is exactly rank k, I mean if a is exactly rank k, then, uh, you know, so you're asking can, can I do with less than k rows or something like that, right? I don't know that. So uh, right now it is independent of the rank of k, right? So that's right, yeah. So, okay, for the Frobenius norm, uh, there is a best possible approximation by SVD if I go to rank K. And the bound I did not write down instead of this will say I can come within this much of the best. There you will need a number of, is sample size depends, has to depend on K. It'll be larger than K, but it has to depend on K. So the result would be I can, if I draw enough samples, but depending on k, I'll get a bound on the right-hand side, which is the best rank k approximation you can ever get, plus some more. Uh, I, maybe I should have written done, that down, but I can, yeah, there, there are results like that for the Frobenius norm. Square root of there? Yeah. So, right. So if you want to put, I think you're saying that if I want to put the right hand side uh, only the spectral norm, so I have to use this time, this is less than or equal to the rank of A times the spectral norm. Right? That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. So uh, we, we'll actually prove that when we do SVD, but yeah. So, so actually, maybe everybody should try to prove that or recall that from linear algebra that the Frobenius norm is at most square, is at most the rank of A times that. But we will prove that when we do SVD. So if you're uh, not already up on it, we'll prove that. So I could have written that in terms of that, but that'll look pretty bad, right? The rank could be M or N, whichever, as high as that, so then the bound doesn't look very good, which is true, I mean. So I should uh, mention that you cannot put just the operator norm here without the M or N, that's not possible. So yes, you can, uh, you do get concentration, Okay, so with some catches, right? Um, you get concentration from the fact that the S choices of columns are independent, that's all. There's only S degrees of independence, or R degrees, that's all. And S and R are thought to be constants, right? So you only get that much concentration. So then we switch to the next, um, next file, just. No, <laughs> C, C for columns and R for rows. But I guess, yeah, it's not the best, uh, it's, it's curse or something, right, yeah. Cures might be, if, is there, if, there, if you could put an E at the end, then it would be cure. But I, we, I mean, I just called it so C. Like yeah. <laughs> or curse or curve or something, yeah. Okay, singular value decomposition. So I'm going to do this in a self-contained manner now. Uh, I mean, clearly, I mean, everybody knows that linear algebra, linear algebra covers, unfortunately, often does not cover SVD, right? Uh, you do spectral decomposition and so on, but not necessarily SVD. Somehow SVD is more useful uh, in terms of handling data because it, you know, it's in a sense more useful than eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Of course, they are different purposes, but uh, it's less covered. So let's uh, see uh, one definition of SVD. There are many equivalent definitions. I'm going to uh, start with one angle. You have n data points in D space, each uh, represented as a row of a data matrix. Uh, I guess I had called it columns at some point. Part, so, sorry, this uh, uh, chapter we called it rows. So 
it's an n by d matrix. Each row has uh, one data point. Singular value decomposition is going to consist of the best fit k dimensional subspace for the data for every k, k equals one, two up to rank of a, where best fit means this. It means I minimize the sum of squared perpendicular distances of the data points to the subspace. Okay. Now, we will see that, which is not obvious, that SVD gives you the best fit for every k simultaneously. Perhaps uh, we draw a picture. So your data points are here. So you have a subspace of dimension two. So dimension two. Since it's a subspace, the origin must be in, on it. This is a subspace. So we take the sum of squared perpendicular distances. So we project, we take for each point its distance, perpendicular distance to the plane, right? Perpendicular to the plane, this plane, right? And square them each. Square and add. Again, the square is important, right? Um, and add them. The, I'd like to say, so that's the same as, and we'll have another picture in the next slide, that's the same as if we maximize the sum of squares of the length of the projection of the data points into the subspace. That's the same as taking this as the length of the projection, and for instance, for this, from the origin to that, right, in that space. I think I have a better picture on the next slide. So I take those projections, square and sum, they are the same, we'll see, a picture will make it obvious. Uh, so this is the picture, right? So this is the data point AI. This is my one dimensional subspace, because easy to draw, V. So I either take these distances, square them and add and minimize them, okay? Or take these projections, square them and add and maximize them, right? And they are, uh, they give you the same result because uh, courtesy of Pythagoras because the sum of squares of these two is a fixed constant independent of the subspace that I'm worried about, right? So it's just the length of AI squared. Therefore, I can think of it as maximizing so, for example, this is the first advantage of using sum of squared projections or distances, right? It's not true if I use distances or projection lengths, then uh, you don't have Pythagoras down for that, okay? Now, we have to contrast this just to make sure we see the difference. For in calculus, we look at least squares fit, and that's slightly different, right? So, least squares fit is what? You have a bunch of points in the plane. Uh, this is xi, yi. You want to fit a best linear function to this, and now the distance is a vertical distance, right? I mean, that's what, that's what this is. Not distances perpendicular to this line, right? So it's different. I mean, least squares, again, you have squares for a reason, right? You remember when you differentiate, it'll be a linear set of equations, so it's easy to solve. Something like that will happen here. Um, that's why you have squares. There's a bigger, there's a, perhaps a bigger difference. In the usual least squares fit, the line doesn't have to go to the origin, right? Least squares fit. I'll be careful to call that least squares and what we have best fit. And least squares will go away after a minute. I'm not worried about that, right? So in least squares, you don't require the line to go to the origin. But in SVD, you do. It's a subspace, so it has to go to the origin. So you may wonder whether that's a good idea. Suppose my points actually look like this. The best one-dimensional fit, the best fit, is also some line like this, which doesn't pass through the origin, right? If I require that to pass through the origin, I get a bad fit, okay? That may bother you, uh, but it'll turn out, it's not very difficult to prove this. We won't do it now, I'll do it later, is that, in fact, if I want the best fit line, not necessarily passing through the origin, you can show that the line must actually pass through the centroid of the data. Centroid is just the average of all these things. So these data points, the average is somewhere here. You can show that the best fit line actually passes through the centroid. So 
So you, you can try that as an exercise. If there's time later, we'll come and do it. It's just, just a simple exercise. So uh, in fact, if you took any line and translated it parallel to itself till it passes through the centroid, that's the best translation. Just best parallel translation that you can do. It just you prove it by writing this down. Um, that's true for any dimensional subspace, actually. If, I, if, if now I'm sitting with points in 3D and I want to find the best plane fit, then you can prove that the best one passes through the centroid. If it didn't, you can translate and gain. Okay. Therefore, if uh, you wanted the best affine space, affine means any translate of a subspace, affine space, you should take the centroid, you can find it by taking averages, and do the translation before you apply SVD. Okay. So if somebody just put all the, you know, put all the data way out, they translate it, doing SVD may not be a good idea. You'll get a line like this. But you really want to get that. So that's called centering data. We'll, we'll go through the proof of this. You can easily do it for lines for high dimensional spaces. It's still just only a calculation. We'll do it later. Okay. So the best, uh, the most important thing is for SVD, we'll show that the greedy algorithm works. The greedy algorithm is find the best fit one dimensional subspace to the data, line through the origin, then find, then find the best fit line through the origin again, perpendicular to the first line. So. If the data were, uh, it's difficult to draw, if the data, data lie on a plane like this, say a coplanar, then you would like to find both axes of this plane. So if you do this process, you'll find the two axes. By the way, this is probably one of the earliest or the earliest greedy algorithm, so it's an important greedy algorithm. We'll see that it works correctly, but it's, uh, you know, it dates back to before uh, minimum spanning tree and all those things. Uh, it's a very early algorithm, right? So at the i step, so second step, you look for a line, best fit line, through the origin, subspace again, perpendicular to the first. At the i step, you look for the best fit line perpendicular to the ones you've got already. You keep doing this until rank of A, uh, i reaches rank of A. And we'll show that when we are done. So um, I'm going to write down, just because some of you may be familiar from linear algebra with the matrix factorization version. Don't pay any attention to it because that's not the viewpoint we want to take. But in any case, at the end of the day, you could write A as a factor, as a product of three matrices, where the columns of V or these lines, or these lines you found. D is a diagonal matrix with positive entries. In spectral decomposition, D would have been the eigenvalues. Now it's the singular values, which we will define. And the columns of U and V are orthonormal. This is called the SVD. Again, uh, now focus just on the best fit lines. Forget the matrix factorization. We'll come back to it. Okay. Okay. First singular vector, right? Uh, notation. This is just a recall. A is an n by d matrix. Each row is a data point. So, uh, if you use the unit vector along the best fit line, we know that again. I'm just recapping this. V minimizes among all unit length vectors, the distance from the data point A to the line through X, right? To the line uh, with X as the unit vector in the direction X. So this is just a projection on X. I subtract out the projection from the length, and that's the uh, distance. So the distance is this. And again, Pythagoras, this is just redoing it. And again, this summed over all I is a constant. It's just the sum of the length of rows squared is just AF. It doesn't depend on X. So I may discard that. Okay. I have a minus sign I'm minimizing, so that's like maximizing AX squared. So we define that to be our first singular vector. So we take the maximum over all unit length vectors of AV, the length of it. Okay. It's the same as best fit, minimizing the sum of squared distances, right? So I, I should have had a square there because I'm minimizing, I'm maximizing the sum of squared projections. But, you know, maximizing uh, something squared is the same as maximizing the absolute value. Of course, you, the answer is squared, but 
it, the result is the same. Okay, there can be ties. There could be multiple V1s. Actually, a simple question. Are there going to be ties or maybe sometimes there won't be? What's an obvious, there is always a tie. What's an obvious tie? Minus V1, right? So if you, if you put a minus, for eigenvalues also that's true. Uh, eigenvector and negative of that or both eigenvectors is the same eigenvalue, right? You choose one. So uh, there can be ties. We break ties arbitrarily. So this org max is not unique. Okay. And the singular value is just a length. So you can view the singular value as how much A magnifies any vector, the maximum amount A magnifies the length of any vector. So, you know, if you draw um, the isotherms, the curm curves along which you get the same value of AV, it'll be an ellipsoid. Uh, I didn't uh, define ellipsoid and all that, but this, the longest axis will be the first singular value. So ignore this picture if uh, you're not familiar, but that's called the first singular value of A. If data, okay, uh, one thing I should say, we will show that the singular values are unique, okay? There's no, uh, even if there are ties for the singular vectors, the singular values are unique. Okay. We'll see that later. If the data points all lie on a line through the origin, the line on which the projections are maximized is precisely that line. If the data points are collinear on a line through the origin, you will get that line, right? That's where the projection is maximized. So that's the first singular vector. For, so now what happens if the data points are coplanar rather than collinear? We'd like to get the two perpendicular directions spanning the plane. So that motivates this definition. Um, we want to define further singular vectors. So think of coplanar data. You really would like the two-dimensional subspace maximizing the sum of squared projections. So we want to take points, project them down. This is the origin. So we want to maximize these length squared. Some of these length squared, right? Now, let's say for the moment I don't know how to find two-dimensional subspaces which do this maximization. I can do a, try to do a Grady. We can define a second singular vector V2 as the one, and here break ties arbitrarily again, which maximizes the sum of squared projections but has to be perpendicular to the first vector. A little algebra shows you that's the same as this, right? Uh, uh, so again, it would have been a square there, but I don't care to put the square. So now V2 is the uh, maximum V perpendicular to V1 of length one that does that. Okay, and V3 is the V perpendicular to both V1 and V2 that maximizes this. Okay. And then you define the second singular value as how much the magnification you get here in the V2 direction. Third singular value, how much magnification you get in the three direction and so on. Okay. And you go on until it's zero. That is to say, I found V1 through Vr. The, every V perpendicular to that makes zero is in the null space of A make zero product with A, right? Then you stop. R will be the rank of A. We'll prove that later. And more importantly, this is not obvious. Even if there were ties for the singular vectors, the singular values are unique, right? I mean, if there were ties, I could have gone down different paths for choosing singular vectors. There's no simple reason right away that the singular values are unique, but we'll see that they are. Okay. If, no, so they'll, they're invariant, they're invariant for the matrix. So they do not depend on the singular vector I choose if they were ties. So I may have, you know, multiple choices of each singular vector, whatever choice, whichever way I come down the tree, the singular values will be unique. It will follow from the main theorem. So the main uh, gist of this most important theorem is that the greedy algorithm works. So 
let's define the best fit k-dimensional subspace again, just done it already, as the one maximizing the sum of squared projection lengths of data points into the subspace, maximized over all k-dimensional subspaces. The theorem says the following. The, it says the greedy algorithm works, that you have this, and I've defined singular vectors. So again, greedy because I picked the best single v1, best single v2 perpendicular to it, and so on. I didn't pay attention to the projections in the k-dimensional space, just one at a time I paid attention to. So it's greedy, so uh, for k equals one to r, vk be the subspace spanned by the singular vectors. Again, there could, be, could have been ties and we picked one choice, but any choice. For each k, the assertion is vk is the best fit k-dimensional subspace for a. Now, I shouldn't say necessarily v, it can be a, right? D there could be many best fit subspaces. There could be ties, right? So when, when you want examples for things like that, the identity is a good example. Lots of ties for the identity, right? Every single value is one and uh, every vector is single. So this is, this is uh, what we'll prove now. Again, this is one of the, this is, I would say this is the earliest greedy algorithm. So it's a very important historically as well as useful way. Very important algorithm. Proof by induction on k. Statement is obvious for k equals one, right? So for k equals one, one dimensional subspace by definition, that's the best. So we proved that. Let's do k equals two. Suppose w is the best fit two dimensional subspace. I like to prove somehow that v2, uh, sorry, uh, let me go back. I found v1 and v2. Their span is capital V2. I like to say V2 is the best, is not the best. Again, there can be ties. Here I assume W is the best. I must prove that V2 is at least as good as W. That's what we'll do. First, uh, a little technical claim. There is a W2 belonging to W so that it's perpendicular to V1. Perhaps a little picture here. So here is the origin, here is V1, and I have a two-dimensional subspace W. The assertion is there is a W2 in this subspace. Length one is not a big problem, W2 somewhere, which is perpendicular to this, right? And the reason is I project V1 onto this, and I can take that angle to be 90 degrees, although it doesn't look like that. So because the projection of V1 onto W spans at most one dimensional space and you can take it orthogonal. It could, the picture is, need not be quite like this. The picture could be that V1 is perpendicular to W. Then I can take anybody here, W2, are all orthogonal. <coughs> Choose any W1 uh, which is perpendicular to W2. So W2 is here and I choose W1, could be this one, right? Scale to one. Uh, and uh, so that W1, W2 form a basis, they're perpendicular in length one. So uh, by convention, sometimes by basis, you only mean a set of orthonormal vectors, which are, I mean, they're all length one, right? So I, don't, I won't have to repeat length one. So basis is going to mean that. Uh, now, now we'll, so I'm trying to prove that V2 is as good as W2. W2 is um, the length, sum of the square projections onto W equals this. And that's just because um, linear algebra, right? So I have the ith data point AI. Its projection onto W squared is just AI dot W1 squared plus ai dot w2 squared. And w1, w2 is a basis, so I take the components along the two basis vectors and square and add them, that's what I get. That's, and then I sum over all i, I will just get that. Okay. The squares are important. Now I want to assert this is true, that v1 is at least as good as w1. So why is that?
V1 is the best, right? Yeah. How about this? Uh, V2 is at least as good as W2. So V2 was the best among everything that was perpendicular to V1, and we made sure W2 is perpendicular to V1. So V2 was the best among that lot. Therefore, it must be bit better than this, right? We add the two, and this is what W thing is, and this is what V2, the capital V2's uh, prediction is, so V2 is at least as good. So that's a proof for K equals two. Uh, uh, now I want to prove for uh, K higher, right? So the inductive hypothesis, we're gonna assume, it's good for K minus one, and I want to prove for K. So again, it's more or less the same proof. I assume that W is the best fit K-dimensional subspace, let's say. And I want to claim, uh, this lemma I erased here, I want to claim that the unit vector WK in W perpendicular to VK minus one. So W is a K-dimensional space, and uh, V sub k minus one, I can't draw fully, is a one dimension lower. There's somebody here perpendicular to all of that. It's just a dimension count, right? So uh, wk is perpendicular to all of that. So now you choose a basis w1 through wk of w. You can always take a vector and complete it to a basis, right? Uh, and so you can choose these orthogonal to this and so on. So that it's w, and now, uh, take the first k minus one, I want to claim this is the length of squared projections on w except for the last one, right? That's less than or equal to that. Okay, why is that? That's the inductive assumption, right? So vk minus one, capital vk minus one, of which this is a basis, was the best k minus one dimensional subspace. We assumed inductively. And this is a k, this is a k minus one dimensional subspace. So this must be better than that. And that's by induction. We also have this. And that is again because vk was the best among everything perpendicular to v1 through vk minus one. And wk was perpendicular to all of those too. Therefore, this is better than that. As you see, the proof is very simple, right? I mean, and then you just add, you're done, right? Okay. So uh, the consequences, so I, I, I guess uh, if you're looking at the book, usually I've, everything I've done is there, but this one we didn't do, but so I'll spend a few minutes trying to prove that. Uh, the theorem also proves that the singular values are unique, even if there are ties for the singular vectors, why is that? Sigma one is unique, okay. Uh, but before unique, you have to prove that it exists, right? It was a maximum over infinitely many things, uh, right? Sigma one was the max over all, max over all unit length vectors of AF. A set of unit length vectors is closed and bounded, right? So, uh, so, so we know that the maximum is attained, otherwise that, that would be a bit of a trouble, but maximum is attained and that's sigma 1a. So it's defined and exists and is unique. Okay. Now, there's a unique value of the maximum over 2D subspaces of the sum of projections squared onto the subspace. Now, this is a little trickier. So the set of 2D subspaces is closed and bounded. It doesn't look like that, right? Subspaces are unbounded. We'll, I'll, I'll show you on the next slide that this is a reasonable thing to do, right? So um, that, that this mu two exists. So call that mu two, right? So we have to prove that mu two exists, right? For that we have to prove that the maximum is attained. It is in fact attained, even though it looks like the set of subspaces are not bounded, but it's, it's still true, okay, we'll see that. So let's assume mu two exists then uh, uh, theorem says that that's mu two, and that's equal to that, right? 
So mu two sigma two squared is just mu two minus that. This is unique. This is unique. So this is unique. Right? And in general, uh, by induction, these are these are assumed to be unique. Mu k be the maximum over all k-dimensional subspaces of the sum of squared projections into the subspace. Then the theorem implies that this is equal to mu k, provided mu k exists. Right? Again, we have to prove that using the inductive hypothesis. Now we see that sigma k is unique. So I have to prove to you mu k exists. So let's do that exercise. I mean, this is not uh, very uh, relevant. Normally, you just assume that after having done whatever advanced calculus, but let's just go over this proof, right? So I want to prove that a sequence of subspaces has a su convergent subsequence, right? Uh, so we have v1 or, oh, these are not my v1, excuse me. These are just any infinite sequence of k-dimensional subspaces of Rd. So I should have called them something else. I want to prove that there is a convergent subsequence, and the caution is that the subspaces seem to be unbounded objects. But what you do is you choose a basis for each vi, and then first take a subsequence of the sequence of bases, or the sequence of subspaces, in which the first basis vector converges. The basis vectors are unit length objects, right? So they are closed bounded. It's a closed bounded set. So there is a subsequence that converges and then take the subsequence of the subsequence where the second basis vector converges. Again, second basis vector, unit length, everything is bounded, closed. So you can repeat that process, and finally you get a subsequence with each basis vector converging. And you, you have to do a little proof that in the limit, the, the, the um, limit of a bunch of vectors of length one is still of length one, right? And also the limit of a bunch of basis vectors is still orthogonal. But these are obvious. Just Lipschitz is true. They, they don't change much. OK? Yeah. So this was an aside, just, just so uh, jog your memory of calculus, right? So, But it does need a proof, because it's not obvious that set of subspaces, a sequence subspaces are a convergent subsequence. OK. So. Let's see if I forgot something. Oh, I didn't forget anything. I, I don't know whether I'm um, accelerating. But anyway, I think I have enough slides so I can go on. Yeah. OK, so singular value is a norm. Uh, uh, so AV1 is a list of lengths with signs of the projections of the rows of A, right? So I take each row and project onto V1. That's each component of AV1. So sigma 1a, which is the length of that vector, you can think of it as if it was a component of A along V1. So each row of this, this is a vector, each row of this is a component of one data point along V1. Together, you can think of this as sort of the projection or the component of the data along V1. Sigma 2, similarly, you can think of as the component of v along, a along v2, the data along v2. Now this is sounding like decomposing a vector into its component along basis vectors. right? In a, in a, in a sense, that's what we're doing. And if that analogy is to carry over, so for a vector you have that. You take the component along basis vectors, square and add, you get the length. right? So you better have the same thing here. If sum of squares is a component equal to the whole, then the analogy would be good. So let's see if that's true. And, and that is, in fact, true, right? So I'm going to take each AI projected along each of the singular vectors and add after squaring. But first observe that if I had a vector v orthogonal to all the R vectors, AI dot v is 0. Because remember, we stopped when we couldn't find anything orthogonal. So these are all 0. Therefore, uh, the length of AI squared is just its component along all the basis vectors squared. Because you really have to take the other vectors orthogonal to Vt, but there aren't any which make any non-zero top product. So this is true. And you just now add up. So I think I did a little bit of calculation here. So I add up all the rows of, of, of all the data points. Each one is a data point. So I just take the product with each singular vector. So I exchange the sums uh, here. And now this thing is the length of 
this thing uh, summed over all the data points is that. Okay. So those are just sigma i squared. So that proves that little lemma that the Frobenius norm squared. So if I, this thing is the sum of squares of all the entries of A, right? Which we call the Frobenius norm squared. So I took the sum of squares in row J, but I summed over all J. So that's just equal to the sum of squares of all the entries, the Frobenius norm. And we have proved that that's the sum of squares of the singular values. Okay, so that actually proves this. That proves this, because R is equal to the rank of A. And one other thing I didn't write down. And sigma 1 squared A. So I, I guess I should have written down this, sorry, this quantity. Singular value is just also the spectral norm, right? We defined spectral norm earlier. It's the same definition. Sing the top singular value is equal to the spectral norm. I should have written that down. And then we have sigma 1 squared is greater than or equal to sigma 2 squared. And that's by definition, right? This is the best overall. This is the best perpendicular to the first and so on. So they're in ascending order, descending order. Therefore, you get that from that, right? Because the, this left-hand side, sum of the t equals 1 to r sigma t squared a is less than or equal to r times sigma 1 squared a. They're all decreasing. Okay, so I'm going to complete SVD. That's what's going to happen in the next few slides. I'm going to tell you uh, how to put this together to get the singular value decomposition. So right and left singular vectors, right? So we, these Vs went on the right-hand side of A, so they're called right singular vectors. Okay. Uh, the vectors AVI will give us left singular vectors. So in the case of eigenvalues, if you had an eigenvector v, you got lambda v. Okay. So when I hit an eigenvector with a, you get the same vector, collinear. But in the case of singular vectors, that's not necessarily true. In fact, there is one simple reason why it's true. Why it's not true, a might be rectangular. So a might be like that, right? So v would be a small vector, a v would be a long vector. So even the dimensions of v and a v don't match. Eigenvalues are defined, eigenvectors are only defined for square matrices, right? So singular values are defined, I should have said that earlier on, singular values are defined for rectangular matrices, of course, because remember, the rows were data. So the number of data points and dimension will not be the same, need not be the same. So V1 to VR are called the right singular vectors, and the vectors A times VI form a fundamental set of vectors. I call them UIs after normalizing. So AVI has length sigma IV. Remember, that's how we defined it. I normalize to length one, I get UI. We'll show later that UI are very analogous to VI. So UI behave as if they were more or less the same thing, except on the other side, right? So U transpose V over all U perpendicular to that. So they maximize U transpose V Sorry, U transpose A, which is the same as A transpose U. So I should have said U or the singular vectors or the right singular vectors of A transpose. UI or we'll have to prove this right singular vectors of A transpose. You I call the left singular vectors now of A, right, of A. By definition, the right singular vectors are orthogonal. The V1 through VR are orthogonal because I define V2 to be orthogonal to V1, V3 to be orthogonal to both those and so on, right? 
We'll show later that the less singular vectors are also orthogonal. We won't show that yet. Now I come to what's probably, you know, it's an important thing uh, uh, and it has a lot of uses, right? It's called the singular value decomposition. In, in the case of eigenvalues, you've heard of spectral decomposition. It's sort of similar. They are related, but I won't tell you the relation yet because I want to focus just on singular values and singular vectors. I don't want to say it's somehow um, um, a sort of copy of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. In a way, it's not. But so, um, by the way, uh, even for square matrices, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors can be quite different from singular values and singular vectors. So, uh, for instance, uh, yeah, if you know what's called page rank, where Google decides uh, how to rank pages, that's based on an eigenvector. You don't get anything good if you base that on a singular vector of A. But there are other cases where singular vectors are useful. Okay. They, they can be quite different when they're both defined also. So A is a matrix, any matrix, VT and UT and sigma T. This is a theorem. I'm going to state the singular value decomposition theorem. Or the, this notation we've already introduced, or the right singular vectors, left singular vectors, and singular values. Then the singular value decomposition, SVD theorem says A is exactly equal. And R is the is is end, right? I mean, there's no more after that. Exactly equal to sigma T which are all non-negative, right? Times ut times vt transpose. ut is a column vector. vt is also a column vector, but transpose is a row vector. So this is an outer product. Namely, each of those things looks like ut vt transpose. So the product is a full-fledged matrix, right? Full-dimensional matrix. It's a sum of those is exactly equal to the sum of those, right? That's what we want to prove. The proof won't be hard. We have already set up many things. Uh, first, uh, first off, for the proof, so to prove that two matrices are identical, this and that, I want to prove they're the same. It's enough to prove, or it's if and only if, they operating on any vector, they do the same thing. So. A applied to V and B applied to V give you the same vector. And, and, and the proof of that is, this is one line proof of that, right? So we see that, right? If AV equals VV for all V, in particular it holds for the unit vector, so the columns are the same. The converse is very simple. Okay, so now we'll use this. We want to prove A and B are the same, where B is this. We want to show that AV equals VV for all V. And so it's enough to show, okay, this is another a standard thing in linear algebra, right? When you want to so, show a bunch of linear equations hold, it's enough to show it for basis vectors. Because everybody's a linear combination of that, and so that's fine. So you have to show for a set of V forming a basis of space, we're going to take a convenient basis, which consists of the singular vectors, V1 through Vr, but then we run out of them, right? There are only R of them. They may not span the whole space. Right? A may not be full rank, so they may not span all of space, all of the d-dimensional space. We complete the basis uh, with other vectors. You can always do that when you have a partial basis. When you have a set of orthogonal length one vectors, uh, you can always complete it to a basis. We choose some completion containing the, f so it contains the first all singular vectors. Such a basis exists. Why? You should know that. So then, now the proof is very simple for, T equals 1 to R, AVT is sigma UT. So let's write this down. So AVT that we know by definition is sigma T UT. That's the definition of UT. How about BVT? So BVT is equal to sum over all T prime, let's call it, 1 to R. So B, I'm going to write down just B itself. Sigma T prime, U T prime, V T prime transpose. This is V, and I'm multiplying it by VT. Okay. So this is an inner product 
By the way, that's not true for outer products, which we'll see later. This is an inner product, so it's zero unless t equals t prime. Zero or t prime not equal to t, since the vt are orthogonal. So uh, I, I should recall, and we'll, we'll see that next time, Vt, Vt prime transpose is not zero, even if t is not equal to t prime, right? So if these are both unit vectors, so one is the first unit vector, and this is the second unit vector, or outer product, this is not zero, right, this matrix. So you have to be a little careful sometimes that's going to come up, but this is inner product, this is zero, they are orthogonal, right? So you get zero for everybody except t, so you get sigma t, Vt. Okay, and therefore uh, that's true for the first R and then for everybody else, Avt is zero because we had to stop at R and Bvt is also zero because those are orthogonal to these, right? And B ends in, um, B ends in a VT, so the first one. So that proves that the singular value decomposition theorem is true. It's possible I don't have, uh, yeah, that's the end of the denominator and numerator are equal. Yeah. But then just normally when you take the singular value decomposition, you can only perform where sigma is all non-negative. Okay, good point. So what happens if the orthogonal bases are also like SOA, right? And the elements of SOA. Yeah. So right, so we should check that, right? Suppose I replace VT by minus VT, then UT will also get replaced by minus so A V T is sigma t u t, right? So if I mu multiply this by minus one, so will u t be. So then you're fine, right? Because uh, this thing will stay the same. The product will stay the same. Two minus one. Yeah, that's fine, but in general, you sort of, is, is there a handedness issue in terms of the basis that you construct? Yeah, whether. You could flip or you could, if there are ties, you could have chosen any one, right? So is that what you're, so for an invariant subspace, I can choose any basis. So if there are a bunch of, okay, so it's sort of exactly like the eigenvalue case. If the top 100 singular values are all the same, the 100 dimensional space consisting of the first 100 singular vectors is an invariant subspace in some sense, and you can choose any orthonormal basis. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, why, so you're saying some of VT, some of all T, VT, VT transpose identity, right? It is for the space, for the R dimensional space. Well, if you're only these, it will be the identity. But it's true that if you can hit it with the minus one and a, so it's also true that if, if there are ties for the singular values, which can be, then you can choose any basis of this. You can do rotation, yeah. Uh, and it's not clear whether one is better than the other one, but you can do rotation. So I should, one, one other point I want to make so what is nice about this as well as spectral decomposition is, is the orthogonality is very nice, right? So if, for instance, if I want AA transpose, I, I can write it as sigma t u t v t transpose. Now the transpose of this is also sigma t, but vt comes in front, right? vt, ut transpose. Okay. 
Now let's uh, make this sum, let's uh, do the index T1 here and T2 here to avoid confusion. So that's equal to, I can, just, I can just multiply them out. I get sigma T1, sigma T2, U T1, V T1, uh, V transpose V, uh, this T2, V, no, U, T2 transpose, okay? This is zero, this is an inner product, right? This is zero unless T1 equals T2, so otherwise it's zero, right? Zero if T1 not equal to T2, therefore this becomes just T1, that we can call it T, sigma T squared, um, UT, UT transpose. Same, uh, same thing as when you had a spectral decomposition. So if you had lambda t, u t, u t of a symmetric matrix, u t, u t transpose, this is spectral decomposition, right? And you can power the matrix. And the eigenvalues will power, but the eigenvectors will remain the same, right? And that's just by repeating this kind of process, right? This is extremely useful in a lot of contexts. Actually, one context where it's really useful is Markov chains, because if this is the transition probability matrix, P to the S is the transition probability matrix of S steps. And that the eigenvalue is just power. The eigenvectors just stay as they are, which is very nice. That's also true of singular value decomposition, right? Of course, it's not symmetric, so uh, you don't get UVs. Okay, so maybe one last thing I'll say as an application of SVD is very trivial in some sense, is if, if A is invertible, so then it's D by D, let's say, then uh, A equals sum over T equals one to D, sigma T, U T V T transpose. All the sigma T are non-zero, it's invertible, they're all positive, they're, none of them is negative, then A inverse. If T equals one to D, one over sigma T, same U T, U T transpose. Okay. And the reason that's true is we just check by multiplication. Check by multiplying. And if it's not invertible, then R is less than D, you can do the same thing. If not, R is less than D, but then A is T equals one to R sigma T U T V T transpose. And you can write what's called a pseudo inverse. This is often written this way. This is pseudo inverse. T equals one to R, one over sigma T again, U T V T transpose, oops, sorry, V T U T transpose. V T U T transpose, same here. I wrote that wrong. This should be V T first U T transpose. And this acts like the inverse in the space of A A inverse is equal to the identity in the R-dimensional space. Okay. And it's useful for a lot of purposes. 